All right. Hello, everybody. This is Mike Lagerquist. I was the former public relations director at MSU Theater back in uh, 99 to 2015. And wow. I'm here with a couple of years. <laughs> yes, I was here. Or these two guys that I'm with tonight were there before, during, and almost after. Tom didn't make it. He, I think I ran him out of town. But I'm here with uh, Paul Hustles, longtime department chair, and Tom Bleasy. Uh, designer extraordinaire, magician, uh, and renaissance man, literally and figuratively. So we're here, about that. <laughs> yes, we're here today just to talk to Tom about some of the, the things that happened while he was here. And maybe Tom, you wanna to begin with just a little bit about when, he, when you were at MSU and how you got there and that sort of thing. So a little background information, Tom. Sure, uh, MFA in 71, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, moved directly into a program that was its co-equal at the University of Iowa and Iowa City, and was there for six years, decided to move on, and literally applied and interviewed coast to coast, from North Carolina School for the Arts, to Cal Arts, to Calgary, <laughs> uh, Saskatchewan, let it, it snow, let it snow. <laughs> yeah, I was all over the bloody place, and uh, this opportunity came up as I was getting on the plane to actually to go to Saskatchewan. Uh, and I said, this looks like a good opportunity. I, I, if I don't take it, I'll call you back. That was Fred Bach. Uh, it was a mess. I called Fred Bach uh, and uh, interviewed here. I was not impressed with the original thought of doing it, but then I started doing my research and realized that in point of fact, this was probably a really nice opportunity. I came and said yes uh, and sold my house in Iowa City and bought one here on a handshake, which would never happen in this day and age. Those are, those are, that was a century ago, Tom, right? They yeah. It that way back then. Uh, well, <laughs> they couldn't offer me the job because it hadn't closed yet. Uh. So it, it was like, but we want you. And OK, fine. Uh, that was also just coincidentally Jane's first year as dean, uh, so she was. That's negotiating. Dean Early that we're talking about. Yes, Dean Dean Early, uh, and the I was here interviewing at Mankato State College. I came to work to Mankato State University. Ah, so that was the first year of that. Were you responsible for the name change? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, that, that what, Tom, what year was that? That was in 77. 77, okay. Um, they had an MA uh, and they had BA and, B, uh, and BA and BS, no dance. There were five faculty members uh, and we had just become the theater department because we had been part of speech and theater. Right. And so, and so for our listeners, so Ted Paul was the original director of theater, but that, that, that's the year that he became chair. But, but he, he was only around for another couple of years at, by that time. Right. Uh, I was also assured, because I had come from a program that have, had an MFA program, I was assured that they had applied for one, it had been, they had been told to put it on the back burner and wait, but that they were sure they were going to get it. And I think three years later. Right, in 1980 was, was when we got it. Yeah, and, it, and that was a, a lesson in academe and politicking. It yep. was brilliantly done and we sailed on in. We've had the MFA ever since, obviously. Yeah, and if I could if I could interject here, the what I had heard because for perspective, I didn't come until 1985, and I wouldn't have come here if we didn't have the MFA. I mean, that's a real draw for not only the students but also for faculty. Right, absolutely. Tom was one of the founding fathers of the uh, of the MFA program, um, but that uh, one of the reasons we got it was the, the the politics of it was that the only other school in the state that offered it was University of Minnesota. They were the only place with a terminal degree. Yeah, right. And yeah. The, the weird thing was, was they didn't have any students from Minnesota. 
And so we argued, it's my understanding, that we said, well, we'll actually admit Minnesotans. Um, and, and ironically, when I got here, I was surprised that most of our students were not from Minnesota, but MFAs are a national, that, that, put you, that gives you a national profile immediately. Right. Right. So, and that's still the case today. We have more students from out of state than in state, although we do have some Minnesotans too. All right. Well, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about getting into the uh, both the academic side and the design uh, side of things? Uh, oh, there were all sorts of fun things. When I came, we were in the quarter system. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we, we kept growing the curriculum. Oh, and there, as I think I mentioned, there were five of us. Uh, Fred Bach, lighting and TD and sound technically, uh, myself scenery and props. Uh, Susan Osman Smith was the costume designer. Uh, Fred, uh, Ted Paul and Paul and Ronald Lawson. Yeah. So there were two directors and three technician designers. That was it. And, and actually that's, that's kind of typical for, you know, if you're gonna have five faculty that, that's fairly typical because, for example, Ron taught theater history and, and so did Fred. Um, and so between the five, you really, you really did cover the bases. Right. But you did, talk about the facility. So, so when you got here, what, what was the physical plant like? Uh, we, we had the Ted Paul, what became the Ted Paul Theater. Yeah. Uh, but that was the only theater we had. And intriguingly enough, of all of the state university system, we were the only campus that only had one theater. All the rest of them had two. And, and, and the reason for that was because we were first. And we were first and, and first one. we had to get the funding for it. They said, you can't spend that much. So they cut the black box theater out for, at the cost of a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, which, I, I heard that it was a hundred thousand. And yeah, it was. When, we, when we built the Andreas, that was 3.8 million. And yeah. if we would have bought it back in the back in the seventies, we would have saved millions of dollars. Yes, but it wouldn't have been the same theater. True. Yes. Yeah. It would have been very different. Yeah. Uh, so, so the 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 building. So, the, when you got there, the Ted Paul, what was what became the Ted Paul Theater, and that didn't happen until uh, nineteen eighty when Ted retired. That was still a new facility, though. It so was. You, you must have been. I was there. I think two or three years after they opened it. Right. We, right. we still had campuses at both at on top and below the hill. Yeah. In fact, if I went to the faculty lounge, it was down in Old May. <laughs> so I didn't make it down there a lot. It's a long trip for a cup of coffee. I'm oh, sorry, which is now a retirement village. Yes. <laughs> Seems appropriate, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, at one point, after we had moved all the way up on top, but we still owned the building. Uh, two of the old classrooms became our prop rooms down mm -hmm. in Old Main. Yeah. Now I didn't know that. So, yeah. so, so you would schlep it down. I mean, you just truck it back and forth to the yep. theater space. Okay. And and after they wanted to start turning them into apartments, they moved us down into what was then the old gymnasium. Yeah. And I almost died because we were on the second floor with the classrooms. And there was a balcony in the main room. And to get the furniture down, they slid it down a ramp. Oh, geez. you know, with all the corrugated parts on it. <laughs> it was such a mess when they were done. And it got worse because then they had to move us out of the building completely. So we moved to a place out by the uh, White Lumber Pole Barn, no heat, and watched all of our furniture falling apart. Right, and when I came, we still had that facility. That was one yeah. of the things I was able to get rid of. <laughs> but you kept um... <laughs> uh, Somewhere in the midst of all of that, we did do the changeover. We got the MFA going. Uh, and our first students were the students who had come through the masters coming back because they wanted to get that final degree. Uh, George Ressler was, I think, the first one. Yeah. Uh, Denny Chandler, they, and the, the thing is, these guys were all teaching already, but they, they wanted to further their education so they could get themselves up on the pay scale. Yeah, and George went to Inver Hills, um, the community college there, and then Denny, of course, was at uh, South Dakota USD right. um, 
for, for decades. What was the first show you designed, Tom? Oh, before I designed the first show, I came for the summer and I was the paint charge. Oh. Ah. Yeah. And, oh, and you'll both love this. You ready for this? I'm in there. I'm painting on the first show. Fred Bach pulls me off to the side. He says, Tom, you got to do three more shows this summer. Don't use all your tricks on one. I said, Fred, I haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> he honestly thought that was it because the person before me had gone to one of the best schools in the country to try to learn how to paint scenery. And his bag of tricks would have been exhausted after that first show. Hmm. He, he, he was not the world's best scenic artist. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, Tom, because that's one of the things when I, when I first met you that I was, you know, there, some of our listeners will know that, that a scenic artist is different than a scene designer. Those are two different skill sets. Right. And, and I had always worked with scene designers who were okay painters. And I remember the first show that we worked on, but, I, but we won't mention that unless Mike is ready for it. But your skills at a, as a painter blew me away. I couldn't believe how, how good you were at that. And I thought, what is he doing as a design professor? He should be making a fortune just painting scenery for movies and, and Broadway because, because you, had, you were so tricky with, with your, with your skill set. By the way, the first show that we worked on, if you recall, was a School for Scandal. School for Scandal. Which I yeah. thought was brilliant. Just brilliant. It was, it was lots of fun. That was one of, one of the things I love is to do as much as I can with as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And we had all of these different environments we needed to have, but I needed a unit set basically. Uh, so I just basically changed out some inset panels uh, that we could flip out and put a new one in magically as we changed scenery. Right. And that, that I think was your forte. I mean, you know, when I think about all the, you know, all the shows that, that I saw you design, remind me when you retired, when did you retire? Seven, 2007. 2007. So, so you know, from 77, I, and of course I, I came in 85, but from 85 to 2007, when I think about the hundreds of shows that, that were there, that, that uh, one of the things, one of the talents you had and still have, I'm sure, um, was the ability to take something, uh, and and I was a pretty cheap producer. I mean, I did, I didn't give you a lot of money. You said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, uh, but you were so clever uh, about about um, how you solved the scenic problems, especially by the time we get to the '90s and the and the and the turn of the century, and the fact that so many playwrights. Uh, were inspired by movies and they weren't writing plays anymore. They were writing movies. Right. And in my specialty, and you did it so well too, was musical theater. And, and musicals are crazy. They're, they're, they're designed for Broadway. They're designed for huge budgets. They're designed for 10, 15, 20 sets. And you would take what we call a unit set and give it 15 variations so that the, the end result was stunning and yet the audience didn't realize that it was it was on a re relatively simple base, but it was just very clever. Were you there when we did Oliver? Yeah, uh, well, I, I did a couple of Olivers, so so I'm not sure if I was this there. This would have been you. the Ronald Lawson uh, directed production. Okay, th that, was, that was before my time. Okay, that was one of my, I was really proud of the, how the problem solving process shows mm -hmm. because at the end of the show, it's a collage of songs from each of the scenes that we just been to, okay? So I designed the set with the last song, with that. parts of all of the sets, mm -hmm. and then deconstructed it and built the rest of the set for each of the scenes around all of that. Yeah, well, can we talk about, so now that we're on this topic, one of the, one of the shows that blew my mind away was um, your design for um, Singing in the Rain. Ah. Do, can, do you wanna talk about, I mean, it, so I think everybody, all, the audience has seen the movie uh, or our listeners have seen the movie, but can you talk about how you solved the, the, the rain problem? Because I, because I have told this story in every theater history class, every directing class that I've taught since that production, because I just thought it was so clever. Well, the good news was that it was the very last scene in the first act, so we could <laughs> clean up afterwards. Uh, but it was a combination of things, one of which was a full stage rain curtain 
which is just a pipe hanging just upstage of the proscenium with holes all along it, uh, and uh, and running basically down into a, a, a trough along the front of the stage. But there were then three basic um, a house fronts, stoops and stairs, and and a couple of uh, street lights and whatnot to, to stand on and hang on. And each of those units had built within them another rain curtain, just one more pipe, just in each of those areas. And it rained as he went to, from, scene, from location to location. And it wasn't until the very end that it rained all the way across the stage. So, so to set that a little bit, uh, you know, and Tom is modest when he says, oh, it was just a pipe, just to get water up 20 feet in the air, <laughs> you know, the pressure. And, right. um, and then allowing that, and then what happened during the song and the song, of course, is singing in the rain. It built. So one unit came on, and the little unit started raining, and the audience went ooh. And then the second unit came on. We kept the first one running because it was on an endless. Once we got it started, the challenge was how to stop it. We got we could get it started. Mm -hmm. The second unit started raining, and the the actor, and that was David Tashney, uh, jumped to the next unit, and he was rained on in the second unit, and the audience went ooh because two units. Well, the third unit comes down and everybody's going, make it rain, make it rain. And, and then by then the third unit rain, that would have been enough. That would have been spectacular. In the script, it just says, oh, do this as a lighting effect because there's no way you can do the rain. And right. of course, I was way too ambitious. And I said, no, Tom, we're not gonna just do a lighting effect. Uh, we've got to do that. Um, and uh, so then we had the three units raining. And then at the very end, if you recall in the movie, the cop comes out. The cop walks out and all of a sudden the entire stage becomes deluged with water. So we're able to do the, the, uh, the uh, umbrella and the, and the cop was able to walk out with the rain pelting on the umbrella. But the fun thing that I remembered was that we had timed it exactly to figure out how much time we needed to dry the stage. And we came up with, was it 14 and a half minutes if I recall? Yeah. And the curtain fell and we had every student in the department mopping up with towels and mops and freshmen. They were just mopping the stage floor wildly. The curtain comes up on act two and it's like there, were, there was no water to be seen. It was right. a miracle. It was, no, it was another bleasy miracle. Now that's a combination miracle as with all things that was teamwork because yep. you can't see water right. unless it's lit properly. Right. Who was our lighting designer? What, and that was, was that Steve who did that show? Or? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so we, and, and that next, that first scene, we were told to, and I kept it to, with a, a smaller uh, profile so that it wouldn't have to be, so it wasn't until the second scene that everything lit up again. But that was a, that was a, a stunner. Are there any other shows that you can remember that, 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 that were like that for you? Oh, that's when, when he gave me the list, it was like, oh, gee, there are so many. Um, and including some fun things like, the show I most wanted to do the second time, let alone the third and fourth time, uh, was Fiddler on the Roof. Oh. It was not the first show I did the second, third, or fourth time. That was Music Man, which was one of my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but, well, it's, it's very popular. Uh, but the thing okay. is, I was able to totally rethink it because I was working with a different director with a different concept about what it was they wanted to stress, how they wanted it to look. So I was able to have fun, even with a show I really didn't like the music for, uh, because the concepts were different enough for me to play with them in a different way. Uh, this would be a big jump, but I'm wondering, since we're talking water, do we want to talk about that other water show? Oh, and what was that? Oh, yeah, metamorphosis, I, maybe? <laughs> excuse me if I faint while we talk about this one. <laughs> the stunner. Oh, that was fun. Uh, and again, you came back from seeing it in, on Broadway, if I recall. Right, yeah. You said, we're doing this show. And then I looked at it and I went, there's a big bloody water mess in the middle. <laughs> oh, okay, right. And we're doing it in the Andreas. Yeah. So we're talking about Metamorphosis by Mary Zimmerman. And, it, and literally it's, it, it, in the script it says, uh, it takes place at a pool. It's, it should be taking place at a pool. And when I saw it off Broadway, uh, well on Broadway at the Circle and Square, 
uh, they had a pool and I thought we could do this. So Tony, want to talk, talk about drama. Yeah, oh, we had all sorts of fun. Uh, the first thing that we did, and I don't think most of the audience was aware of it or really thought about it. When they came in, they went up a ramp yeah. and or up steps so that the first row of seats was actually three feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. we, we had the modular audience system and I simply got rid of the first sections so that what was supposedly floor level was three feet off the ground. So we were able to build a two and a half foot deep pool. So it was very much like stadium seating on a three quarter thrust. Um, right, deep thrust. Uh, and uh, we managed to get a corporate sponsor by the name of Swatsky Pools. He was really, he did not get it at first, but then he saw what was going on and he went, oh gosh, yes. Uh, uh, and the first scene, they're at the very upstage edge and they're splashing around in about three inches of water, which is kind of fun. So they're walking on water. But they're, yeah, but it's, it, the theory, it looked like, oh, it's a three inch deep pond. Waiting pool, yeah. Right, and then in the second scene, they go out to sea and the sea monsters come and there's the battle royale and the place is awash with water. Uh, and, and for the audience there, what happens is the god Poseidon uh, makes a grand entrance, uh, but he doesn't walk on stage. He literally is lifted from the water, the pool of water, and rises, you know, like Excalibur from the lake. As do two, his, two, his two helpers, his two henchmen. Yeah, yeah. So we had a secret entrance into the pond, which was also used for someone's drowning later on in the show. Right. Don't tell anybody that, because we, we, we normally... Whenever somebody wants to know the secret, I tell them they have to give a donation to the theater before oh. I tell them what the... <laughs> so they need to give me a password so I can tell them what the secret is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, it was magical. I mean, I, there were... Well. And I loved it during the show when people would come up and say, how did you do that? And I said, uh, can you give money to the theater? And I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, because literally during the show, somebody appeared in the middle of the pool. Yes. And, and, and also somebody disappeared into the pool and swam. And never came back. Yeah. And that happened, that happened several times, actually. So several times people drowned or, you know, or they were gods. So they just went back to their home world. Uh, and of course, part of that is also the, the, the Hades, so that the pool became the River Styx, the pool became all kinds of things. But, but Tom, you know, what, what I thought was stunning about that, you know, and so that they had that at the, in the, on the Broadway version too. Although interestingly, when the Guthrie did it then and brought back Mary Zimmerman his, herself, they did not do it that way. They couldn't do it. Um, and we had many, dozens of our patrons said uh, they saw it at the Guthrie, but hated it because at, at MSU, they had the magical pool because Bleasy did it. Whereas at the Guthrie, they just had some you know, Broadway designer who didn't have a clue or they just physically couldn't do it. Because if you recall, we had to, we consulted engineers about putting in, do you remember how many thousands of gallons of water that was? It was thousands and thousands. It, it was, and I, and I know for a fact that a cubic foot of water is 68 pounds. Hmm. So, so we had thousands of cubic feet of water and we had we brought in an engineer and no, we brought in three engineers before <laughs> I found one that was willing to say, if you put this stuff down here and hold it up, you can do this. <laughs> so, so what we did was we we had to go down to the dance studio and put up support. And of course, the Andreas Theater was still relatively new. And I thought, oh my gosh, we just spent millions of dollars building this theater. Now we're gonna bring it down. But what a glorious production that would be. <laughs> but but that but that was part of it. The other part that was so wonderful from a lazy artistry was the fact that the, the pool was fantastic enough, but around the pool, we had this beautiful hardwood deck. So it looked like a, a very wealthy, it looked like Glenn Taylor could have built this swimming pool. Uh, we had this deck and then we had crystal chandeliers. Um, we had, a, we had a, 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 a psych, you know, a little skyscape which is very difficult to do in the Andreas. Again, stunning lighting design by Steve. Um, and, um, and so the, when the audience walked up the staircase and made that turn to go into the stadium seating, it literally took their breath away just to see this design before the show even began. Um, it, it already created that magical, that magical look. 
Speaking of reusing things, by the way, those chandeliers we purchased for School for Scandal for you. Oh, yeah, that's right. They looked familiar. I, I knew we didn't go out and buy another set. <laughs> and interestingly, and see... the furniture that ended up in your house. I mean, oops. Oh. <laughs> Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain was my first show at MSU. Oh, and, wow. And I remember Metamorphosis because there were times when we were bringing people in in the audience, I would be standing as they came in, they had to turn either right or left onto those oh, right. basically docks. And I can remember being there with my the heels of my shoes almost hanging over the edge, going to the water and somebody coming up and handing me a walker. And it's like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm in the middle of a lake. Um, Throw it in the water. <laughs> I, I bet it floats, so we could have done that. But I, I also wanted to mention uh, another part of the design team for that, I believe, was Mike Croswell. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The d dearly, dearly departed Mike, who did a, an original score, and he did a lot of scores for us um, over the years. And and what was interesting there is that it was um, he wrote all kinds of wonderful music that we and of course I changed it. It, it had musical elements, and I changed it more into a musical than it than it usually is. Um, but he literally did. Uh, improv music throughout the entire thing as well. Uh, the other thing I could say is we submitted this for the uh, Kennedy Center. We had a Kennedy Center uh, uh, responder come and see it. And usually the responders will give out one award. Uh, they're called certificates of commendation. And, and if we see a really good show, we're able to give out two. Um, the guy who came to see this, who was the vice chair of the region at the time, said, said, uh, said this, is, this is astonishing. And he gave us six. <laughs> uh, that's, I think those are the, that's the most commendations ever given, and and he had to. And Tom, you got one, I I, I believe. David got this, one. Design, Mike got one, and the cast got one for Ensemble Light. It was stunning. It was just stunning. You want to drop some of the names of the people who were in that show, Paul? Well, we we had um, there there were there were a bunch. I mean, I remember Brad Wilkitz was in that show, and Chris Queasley, uh, Robert Gardner, uh, Kristen Spratt was in that. Uh, Amber. Moser was in that. I mean, we, it was just a stunning, stunning yeah. uh, cast. Rick Daniger. Yeah, Trick. Trick was in it. Be a beautiful, beautiful production. Now, since we're talking about Zimmerman, let, let's just stay on that topic for a little bit because when, Tom, after you retired, um, I had the opportunity to direct a show that was, uh, was also uh, entered into the uh, Kennedy Center Festival uh, by Mary Zimmerman, uh, a show that I think is not as good as Metamorphosis, but it had to tour. And I thought, I've got to bring back Tom to do this because it is so complicated. And that was our production of the Odyssey that, uh, that happened uh, um, after you retired. So you wanna talk about some of the design challenges with that? Well, the real challenge with that is it's the Odyssey. He went all over the known world at the time, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it had to pack up into a little truck and we had to literally instantaneously scene shift from one country to another. And we ended up performing it in three states in three different stages. So again, it, and, and we didn't know that. We, we thought we were just going to get We just hoped we could get onto the regional, but and hope and really didn't think we'd make it to the national. But, uh, but it was that was about as minimal as you can get. Uh, there were basically pieces of fabric and poles and set pieces, props, furniture, things that were handheld. That was the set. Yeah. There was nothing bigger than that. Well, I remember. The, and the, the amazing thing to me was that it was just a, it was like a bag of toys. Um, you know, we talked about it, you know, what I, and, you know, and this is a show that I had never seen before. You know, usually, you know, my modus operandi is usually I see it on Broadway and think, how can we scale it down? Except for Metamorphosis, which I thought we can do better than they did. Um, but with Odyssey, I'd never, I had never seen it. And, and I just thought, what's the minimum amount that we need? And, um, and, and again, Tom, the, 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 a rug or uh, a pole or uh, the, the sails. Um, and Tom, you don't know this, but they, they still use a shot from the Odyssey to represent the Kennedy Center National Festival because we were, there were, there were three full length productions picked out of 1300 productions that year. And was that 2010, 2011? Uh -huh. And yeah, and, and, and uh, three out of 1300. 
And then, then there was a budget cut. So that was the last time they brought fully mounted productions um, to the uh, Kennedy Center. And again, we got all kinds of awards for that one. Mike Croswell also did the music for that. Right. Steve Smith also did the lights. David McCarl in both cases did our costumes. Um, and, um, but, but the things that you added were just um, small, but absolutely perfect. And, and you know, some people define art uh, and I know we could debate what art is. I don't know what art is, but I do know that it's somebody selecting something that, and whether that be a toilet seat or, or, or uh, a head or a pole, um, those are the things that are spear. Uh, those are the things that make art work. And it was just, a, again, a brilliant design, I thought. One of the things I, I learned very early on when I was in grad school is the difference between good and great is detail. Yeah. You've got to care about the details. If the details are right, it's brilliant. If, if they're not, it's okay. Yeah. And, and, that, and that more is not better. Um, right. Sometimes less is really more. But, but if, it, if there's less, the, the detail is even more important. What were some of the biggest challenges from that one, Tom, besides the fact that you were thinking it might have to pack up and move and be set up? The biggest challenge, believe it or not, was finding the right poles. Yeah. Yeah. They, they look like they're hand railings or something of that nature, but they, they would have been too heavy. They would have been not appropriate to do all of the things we wanted to do with them, and they weren't making the right sounds. These were special, actually it was George Grubb, who by the way, as a grad student was the TD for Metamorphosis. Oh, yes. And as a faculty member was the TD for Odyssey. Uh, he found the poles. Uh, in fact, he ordered one each of a bunch of different things. We brought them in and it was like, yeah, this one right here. I think they're still around actually. Oh yes, yeah, we've, I've actually used them a couple of times. And, and, uh, and what Tom is referring to there is that, is that the poles had to be oars and they had to be spears and they were percussive instruments. So they became sound instruments. They became, they, they marcated uh, space uh, and, and they became fences. They, they, they were just, you know, we used them a lot uh, yeah. and, and they were perfect. And they were long too, weren't they? 12 feet or 10 feet or? Oh, no, they weren't that long. They, oh, I think okay. they were eight actually. They were eight feet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or that, or Kim Stefan would have just been sitting straight <laughs> on Goddess Athena, and, and she was only three feet tall. I think she was the, she was a, a short gal. <laughs> and that, by the way, is yet another cast full of stellar students. Yeah, yeah, starring Clayton Rutschow as our, as uh, our yes. Oh, uh, was it Boys in the Band? Somebody just posted a. a it, oh, it was uh, James. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, what was it? It's boys, the something boys. The uh... he was the headmaster. Um, Susan, Susan was yeah. the school teacher, headmistress, whatever. Yeah. Oh. And Clayton was one of the one of that group of boys. Oh, and you talk about the, so that's another production, History Boys. Yeah. It, it yeah. was History Boys. It was History Boys. That's what it right, was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah. That was a that was a great production too. Yeah. Uh, if I may go to a slight tangent here, speaking of students. The design students that I had were phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, even the ones that didn't know for sure they were. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Shannon. Um, Alan Shannon. Yes. Who, who was, he could have taught the, the classes I was teaching him in. Um, and he could have taught ballet. He was a stunning and, and ballet as well, and performed the lead role in a couple of the shows. In cats. <laughs> in any event, Alan came to us first to finish his undergraduate degree because he hadn't quite really finished it. As a non then, non trad student. Yeah, uh, came back, uh, started designing shows. I I basically made him do main stage shows. I think from the beginning. Yeah. But the one that to this day still impresses me is I said you're doing Peter Pan. Hmm. And he just, he lost it. He said, I can't do that. There's just no way. <laughs> and it was brilliant. It won awards for crying out loud. Yeah. Sometimes convincing the student is the hardest part of the process. 
Well, and, and the, the first student that I remember, you know, so vividly was one again, who came with me my year and that was uh, Kurt Enderley. Um, yes. I, I mean, because I, I remember that Kurt even, uh, Kurt had his undergrad degree from us. Um, but, uh, but I remember when you told me, uh, because you, you, you know, during the summer you had another gig, the Renaissance Festival, and uh, I was desperately looking for a designer and you said, well, Kurt, Kurt can do it. And this is what, I think this was when he was a junior or was it when he was a senior? But, but either his junior or senior year. And, and uh, you said, yeah, Kurt, Kurt can do this. And I said, no, I said, not an undergrad, that, I, I don't know. And, and then you said, well, he could, do all, he could do all the shows. And I went, no, and he did. And they were stunning, yeah. I, just stunning. And then of course he's, he's doing stunning work right now. So we'll have to do an interview with Kurt with, with yeah. the season. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea either, actually. Uh, and well, and he came back and designed two more shows with us, I think. Right, as a guest artist. Yeah. yeah. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Angels in America. Angels in America was just, oh my God, what a design. Matter of fact, I have the model here somewhere. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> well, Tom, are there any other students and or designs that you wanted to mention? I, I would love your, your, your actually your one of one of the uh, students, Gretchen Potter. Oh yeah. Uh, convinced me she could do a show. I, I don't remember which one it was now. Uh, I can remember some of what the design looked like, but I certainly don't remember the title right now. Ah, hmm. oh, Cyrano. It was Cyrano. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, no. and well, here and here's the irony. I. As usual, I usually go through the list of this is the shows we're going to do. Is there a, a grad student that can do a show? They should do this show. Is there an undergrad that should do a show? They should do this show. What's left over is what I get, right? Except the show I designed to get me into the United Scenic Artists Union was Cyrano and I had never done it. <laughs> so I was by golly going to do Cyrano. She came up to me and she said, I need to do Cyrano. I need this in my portfolio. And I went, okay. And, and, and he was great at it. It was a, a very nice design, but it was like, ah. Well, and, and what was funny was that, and I directed that show, and what happened was I was counting on you and I working it together because, because um, sometimes I'm a coward as a director, but with you as a designer, I was fearless and I knew I could direct anything. And when you came to me and said, uh, Gretchen is going to do. Uh, Cyrano, and if you recall, I went, are you crazy? There's no way that yes. that's going to happen. So I interviewed her and she came in and she said, uh, she said, yes, I think I could do this. And, and uh, I said, are you scared to death? And she said, absolutely. And I said, you're hired. Uh, because, because what I needed to know is that she understood, because unlike the Odyssey or Metamorphosis, which literally, as, as Tom said, went from world to world to world, um, Cyrano had four discrete acts in four totally different areas. And of course I envisioned them as being very complete sets because of when that play was written at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Right. And she did it yeah. on budget. It was wonderful. Of course, Tom, you, you had quite a bit, you know, because one thing you did was not only did you design the sets but you advised students in a stunning way. So whenever we had a problem, she would go, I don't know. And then she would disappear. And I knew she was talking to you. And then she would come back with several solutions that I thought, yeah, that's, you know, or we would ask the question, what would Bleasy do? <laughs> what were some of those elements that, that you used to teach students, Tom? You talked a little bit about the detail being important. Basically, it's a matter of, I, I, one of the things I talked about uh, is that theater in particular, but a lot of art, but theater in particular is about gathering and sifting and winnowing. So that when you know what the show is going to do, the first thing you do is you grab anything that might have something to do with the show and you get it all together. And then you start looking at each piece and you go, this is good. This is I need this one, I don't need this one. And you start getting rid of the stuff that you don't have to have because that's where your show is. 
uh, and when you say, well, everything here is stuff I have to have, there's, there's their design, now make the pieces work. Um, the other, one of the other things, uh, and I, I agree, Paul, I, I love musicals, but the key with musicals is not this is the scene, but this is the scene, and this is how you get to the scene, and this exactly. is how you leave the scene. Yeah. The transitions are crucial in musicals. Yeah, and Tom, that's, that's why you're so good at them, because I've, I've worked with many designers who are really good, but, but the scene changes, I mean, those tech rehearsals, <laughs> Yeah, it was just horrifying because it was like, where, where does that come? And with you, it was all, you know, that was always part of the design. It was always not what, not where are we, but where did we come from? Where are we going? And that's so important for a designer. The uh, one of the other things uh, is you you have to basically tell your design student you're going to have a different experience with every director you ever work with. <laughs> Some are going to be authoritarians. Some are going to literally walk in and say, well, what do you guys want to do with this show? And everything in between. Uh, in, in the case of, of Paul, when I'm doing a multi-scene show, I know I can give him all the puzzle pieces and let him choreograph it because he loves doing it. And, he's, and he knows exactly how it's got to happen. With some others, not so much. Uh, but. Uh, when I first came here, my directors were, were Ted Paul and Ronald Lawson. And again, you got to listen to folks. Yeah. Fred Bach said to me, no matter how big you make a set, you'll never make it big enough for Ronald Lawson. <laughs> no matter how small you make a set, you're never going to make it small enough for Ted Paul. <laughs> That's true. Ron, Ron was famous for his, for his grand grand scale stuff i mean nobody could do that like like ron could and then and then and then ted was was literally by the book he would often often there'd be a floor plan at the back of the book and he would yep. take a look at that and go this is what i want yeah uh, and i uh, remember one one unit box set i i did he walked onto the set the first time that they actually had the setup and he's looking at the window and he's looking at the window and i said what's the matter ted he said that's supposed to be a door <laughs> Because in the original four plan, the original. <laughs> but even though he, yes, he goes by the book. When I did Cherry Orchard, there were no walls. Yeah. The entrances, the frames for where the entrances should be were where they were on his floor plans in the back of the book. But he didn't need the walls as long as his entrances and exits were right. Well, and, and that reminds me of another compliment that I can give you, Tom, and that is, is that I've always taught that, that a play speaks with its own voice and, 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 that, and that if you have a design that's a, quote, bleasy design or a hustle's direction, then you're not serving the play. You know, what you want to do is Chekhov's uh, play or Shakespeare's play or Mary Zimmerman's play. And, and one of the things that I loved about your design portfolio is that it is so eclectic depending on what you're looking at, you know, the, the variations of the designs so that you, you, you know that it's got a bleasy quality to it, but, but it's not, oh, all of Bleasy's plays have, I remember, for example, for a while, the Guthrie was uh, in their blue plastic phase and yeah. every set for like three years had blue plastic. I don't know if they got it on sale, um, but it was very weird. And, and uh, with yours, every show that we did together, I, I always felt served the play um, and and uh, and that you you adapted and you changed. So if it had to be um, another play that I remember way 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 back when was your was that when we did um, arsenic and a lace together. And uh, uh, yeah. I I live in a house that that is that Queen Victoria was was on the throne when my house was built. <laughs> and your set, the detail and the painting, um, and the props, everything was just so stunning in that show. Um, and, and couldn't be, and literally the opposite of something like the Odyssey. I mean, absolute diametrically opposed. And that was one of the other things I love about what I always did. I did that show twice, mm. but they were in two different theaters and they looked entirely differently. Right, right. Because while the show was exactly the same, the director was different and the space was different that it was being done in. <clears throat> 
Okay, well, while we could go on and on about this, and, and we may bring Tom back, he may be our first guy that we bring back for a second time, because we've got this little thing called the Andreas Theater that we'd like to talk to him about. Uh, oh. Why don't you tell people, Tom, what you've been up to, and you've got about three minutes for this, uh, what you've been up to <laughs> since you retired in 2007. Uh, uh, high points. Actually, before, uh, before I left, um, I uh, was asked by the architect of the Andreas Theater, uh, if I would be interested in doing theming work for a hotel and water park, which is known known as the uh, Holiday Inn and Water Park in Maple Grove. Wow. Uh, supposed to feel like you're going to Venice. Uh, I did another one with him in uh, Albuquerque. Uh, and then the pool industry died, as, <laughs> as it were. Uh, but as luck would have it, at that same time, I started working with a former student from the University of Iowa in Iowa City, who is, is, owns Troop America and Stage West, which does the Medora musical for the last 40 some odd, 50 some odd years. Uh, and for four years, I designed the scenery for the Medora musical. And as I was leaving there, I started doing design work for the Minnesota Renaissance Festival, which is pretty much where I've been since. Although for some reason, nobody's doing that right now. And Tom, of course, also was a performer. Uh, because yes. I'll never forget when I, when I, I couldn't even recognize him when he was in his full getup, uh, you, you know, as a, as a magical wizard. <laughs> Nostra Thomas. No, Nostra Thomas. Yes, that, that little ham just needed to be fed every now and again. <laughs> oh, I would say it was a big ham, Tom. I, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> but that was another thing that you brought to our stage is that we often did magic, like with Wizard of Oz, we had some magical effects that were really magical. I mean, they really were uh, yeah. you know, certifiable magic. <laughs> there, a lot of it was literal magic. Uh, actually, another one of them was, was uh, Dracula. Yes, yeah. When, when we had him elevate her and swing her around the bed post, yeah, uh, that was literally an, an honest to gosh stage magic trick that I converted to be there. But equally as much fun is theater magic, which is what Christmas Carol was. Yes, yeah. Furniture moving out all by itself and door opening, uh, door and frame coming out, moving out on stage by itself the door opening and closing and going from one side to the other, there was a technician behind it during the whole time and no one ever knew it because of the way in which it was choreographed. Magic. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what theater is all about. So that's why we were talking to Tom today. And it seems like a logical place to kind of wrap things up. So uh, we thank you all for, for coming along and, and watch as we continue to reach into the past of Minnesota State University Mankato Department of Theater and Dance and remind you of some of the great things that have happened and what's still happening once this COVID thing gets past us. So thank you very much and look for us in the near future. Look for Tom at a water park near you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. It's my pleasure.